Hello everybody. Tonight I come to you from my bedroom. <laughs> this is kind of odd teaching you from random places around my house. It's kind of like Where's Waldo, but where's Rayburg? You should play a game like that. I'll just go like random places around Placentia, your Belinda, making these little videos and that'll be extra credit to figure out where the heck I am. Alright, anyway, new chapter. This time, you guys need to study. Study your little booties off. Because this last one, yeah, that wasn't so good. Um, I think you guys are realizing that it takes a little bit more effort than just writing down some notes and attempting to fill in a packet. So hopefully this chapter, you guys will get it together a little bit. All right? So next chapter, next unit is on the cell. This is chapter seven in the book if you want to look at any part of the book to compare. Um, but this all has to do with the history of the cell, or the first section has to do with the history of the cell, how it got discovered, because it wasn't until the discovery or the invention of the microscope until uh, we could actually see these little bitty things. So, we're going to do a little history lesson right here. No, you don't have to know the actual dates. Yes, you do have to know the actual people and what their main contribution was. Okay. Excuse me. Okay, sorry about that. As I was saying... So starting with the history of the cell, it all started way back about 400 years ago when this guy right there, Robert Hooke, was the first person to look at cells through a microscope because that is a microscope that he invented. It was very simple, nothing too uh, difficult to make, um, but it was very rudimentary. It's kind of like a really nice magnifying glass is pretty much all it was. And so he took a chunk of a cork tree. Uh, we have one outside I can show you guys. But he took some of the bark from the cork tree and sliced it up super thin and looked inside of it. And what he saw were all these little boxes like this. And these boxes were what he thought looked like um, little rooms or something. But um, what he was looking at was actually the cell walls of the tree bark, of the tree cells, so the cellulose. And so the, where the cell used to be was in the middle and was hollow because bark is pretty much just all the dead um, cells left behind. And so he didn't realize what exactly it was he was looking at. He just looked at tree bark and saw all these little holes inside. And he's the guy to coin the term cells. So it was because of him we call them cells and not, you know, balloons or whatever else. So uh, Robert Hooke, first guy to look at any sort of thing underneath the microscope. So years went by, not too many years, as you can see, 1673. And this guy, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, uh, he's Swedish, he saw cells in a drop of water. So he made this new funky looking microscope which had a point and there's a lens right there. And by putting something on the point and then twisting this little thing and around it would bring it into focus. These are his drawings from what he saw in the drop of water, and they were moving around and stuff, and he thought, well, this is really strange because, you know, water's water. There shouldn't be anything um, living inside of it. And so he, he noticed that they were kind of like little animals, the fact that they moved around and interacted with each other, but they were tiny, like molecules, so he decided to call them animalicules, animalicules, because it's a combination of the word animal and the word molecule. And uh, so he kind of took this idea from Hook, decided to make the microscope a tad better, and then he was able to look at living things. So it's because of him we came up with the word of, or the world of microbiology. So micro, small biology, study of living things. So without this guy, you know, having to look in what he thought was fresh water because you know they were this is the type of water they were drinking at the time they didn't know what else was in there and so now they're like oh wow there's living creatures in the stuff we drink and bathe in yum 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 okay so a while later this guy he looks very stuffy um, check out those chops oh yeah uh, this guy Theodore Schwann Schwann was only a couple not that long ago he was a zoologist he studied animals and he decided to take a look at um, different types of animal tissues. And he noticed that they too were all made out of cells. 
So each of these little guys right here, these are cells. These are flat cells, and these are flattened cells, and these are round cells. But he said that pretty much any animal you looked at, it, if you looked at their tissues underneath the microscope, he said, yep, all animals are made out of cells. So then this guy, Matthias Schleiden, Schleiden, I like that word, uh, in 1845, not too much longer, he was a botanist. Botanists study plants, and apparently they like to tuck their hands via Bonaparte style in their um, shirt when you take a picture. Here's his microscope. Looks a little bit more complicated than what Hook and them were using. But he was looking at different plant tissues and what he noticed was that no matter what part of a plant you looked at or what type of plant you looked at, he found that they too were all made out of cells. They're like, wow, that's pretty cool. So anything alive seems to be made out of cells. Then a little bit later, another guy, Rudolf Virchow, that dude right there, looking all steadily with that mass quantity of beard right there. He was a physician, so he's a doctor. And he said that all humans are made out of cells. So they all started to kind of put their thoughts together and thought, huh, plants are made out of cells, animals are made out of cells, humans are made out of cells. Okay, well, let's go with this. And so they came up with the cell theory. And the cell theory, Schleiden, and Schwann, and Virchow, and a little bit of Hook and Lewin Hook. Without them, we wouldn't have a microscope, so it's kind of good. But they came up with a cell theory. Yes, you have to know all three parts of this. Yes, you should be able to recite it from memory without looking at anything. Okay? One, every living thing is made out of cells. If you're alive, you have a cell. At least one. Doesn't matter. You have to have at least one. Two, cells are, dare I say, the monomer. What's that word? Uh, the monomer of living things. It is the basic unit of structure and function. That means all living things. This is our building block. This is our monomer. And three, now this one came from these guys, but a little bit of experimentation was that all cells, nucleus, if I were to get a new cell, it has to come from the division of a pre-existing cell. So if these are the new cells, this is my old cell, I can't get new cells just popping out of nowhere. They call that spontaneous generation. And there's been lots and lots of experiments to prove that. So uh, they came up with that all new cells have to come from old cells, that you can't just spontaneously create a cell out of nothing, okay? So once we started getting this idea of microbiology and looking at cells, they started to get better microscopes and, and uh, better magnifying glasses, and then they could see the cells weren't just these little empty boxes or something with a little dot in the middle. They found that there's lots of other stuff inside. And so they realized that no matter what type of cell they looked at, whether it was a bacteria or a um, cell with a nucleus, they found that all cells had three things in common. One, they all have a cell membrane. And this is this outer layer of a cell. Any cell, doesn't matter, has a cell membrane. Two, has DNA, either stored here in a nucleus or if you're a bacteria, you just have this dense area of DNA, not a real nucleus, but um, similar to it. And so you have to have DNA. And the third thing is you have to have cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is just the fluid that all the little guys float around in. Even little bacteria have cytoplasm floating around in it as well. So they found out that all cells, no matter where it's from, have these three things in common, regardless. Okay? Now... There's two main kinds of cells. In the whole entire world, if you're alive, you come into one of two groups. You're either a prokaryote or a eukaryote. Okay, pro means first. And so it's widely believed that the very first living creatures on Earth were uh, bacteria. And so bacteria are the only example of these types of things called prokaryotes. And bacteria are just cells that have no nucleus. Like I said, they have a, a region of DNA no nucleus, no organelles, and they're usually pretty darn small. A lot of them even have a cell wall that goes around it like that and protects it. Some of them even have little hairs like cilia or a big long one called a flagella. So everything that's a bacteria is a prokaryote. If it ain't a bacteria, it's a eukaryote. So eukaryote, everything else besides bacteria. So these are cells that have the cell membrane, they have a nucleus, and they got organelles. Organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum, 
maybe they have a vacuole, maybe some mitochondria, maybe some chloroplast. They got stuff inside. They've got stuff in there. And they're usually bigger. Like if this is a regular animal cell, here's a prokaryote in size relation. So they're bigger. They may or may not have a cell wall, depending on the type. If it's an animal cell, no cell wall. But if it's a plant cell, then yes, we have a nice big cell wall around it. And this one, way more specialized because each of these little organelles inside do little jobs for the cell. Just like we have organs that do jobs inside of us, they have organelles that do jobs for them. Okay? So, two main types of cells, prokaryote, bacteria, eukaryote, everything else. And so that would include animals, that includes um, fungi, that includes protists, and that includes plants. So this is the everything else. This one up here, only bacteria. Only kind, that's all there is. So if you're a bacteria, you're a prokaryote. If you're not a bacteria, you're a eukaryote. Do you need to know the difference? Yes. Do you need to know examples of them? Yes. Do you need to know what characteristics they have? Yes, you need to know these things. Okay, let's see. Here's just a little example showing the difference between the two. Prokaryotic cell, bacteria. We can see the red is um, says plasma membrane. That's a cell membrane. There's a cell wall, the yellow around it. It's got some DNA. It's got cytoplasm. So there's our three characteristics. Eukaryotic cell also has DNA, also has plasma membrane, also has cytoplasm, but has a nucleus and endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi bodies and mitochondria and proxosomes and all sorts of other stuff like that. And so um, size-wise, 0.1 to 10 micrometers, 10 to 100 micrometers. So this guy's 10 to um, 100 times bigger than the bacteria. And then over here, just so you can see the difference between the two, eukaryote and prokaryote. So remember, prokaryote, bacteria, and this guy, everything else. Okay. So a little Venn diagram to kind of help you see what do they have in common. They both can have flagella, little tails. Uh, they both have a plasma membrane. They both divide. They both have cell division. They both have cytoplasm. They both have ribosomes and chromosomes, which we'll talk about later. What do they not have in common? Eukaryote, that guy, is bigger. He's got a nucleus. He has all these crazy appendages. He's got linear DNA with histones. That means nothing right now to you. Membrane-bound organelles, membrane receptors, mitosis, cell wall simple when present, cytoskeleton, big ribosomes, a lot of stuff. What do prokaryotes have? That guy right there. Teeny tiny, smaller, um, unbound nucleoid. So that's uh, not really a nucleus. Simple appendages, circular DNA. So, you know, ours comes in, looks like a ladder. Theirs is a circle, funky. Uh, no organelles. They reproduce through binary fission, something we'll talk about later. No membrane receptors, very complex cell wall, small ribosomes, no cytoskeleton. So this is a nice little example showing you what things that they have in common with each other and what they have different from each other. Okay, so what do you need to know? Okay, let me go back. Okay, yes, you need to know these guys. No, you don't need to know the, the years that they did it. You need to know what their major contribution was and what major thing they said. So hook, first guy, microscope, cork cells. Lewin hook, living drop or um, water, looked at living things, animal molecules. Schwann, zoologist, animals are made out of cells. Schleiden, botanist, plants are made out of cells. Virchow, doctor, people are made out of cells. They came up with the cell theory. Living things are made out of cells. Cells are the basic unit of structure and function of things, and new cells come from old cells. Yes, you need to know all three of those and be able to recite them, no problem. You need to know the three things that they all have in common with each other, prokaryotes or eukaryotes, doesn't matter. You need to know the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote and an example, and how would you be able to tell by looking at them, okay? That's what you need to know. Those are the things that you have to memorize. Those are the things that you need to be able to recite off of your head without looking at anything. If you do not know those things, you will fail the test again, okay? Am I making this clear for you? I hope I am. Okay, we will talk about this all tomorrow. Good luck studying. Start studying now. Don't wait till the night before. It doesn't do you any good, okay? Study about 15 minutes every night of all the new stuff you learned and the old stuff that you've learned. That'll help you out. 
Okay, I'm done. I will talk to you tomorrow.